You're looking at 4,000 horsepower. When we were racing them, the guys used to say, well, why are you running this old junk? Well, back at that time, this old junk was what they were calling speed equipment. I mean, I could get into it if you, if you really want to know. This is out of Huey helicopters of the Vietnam era. Why don't I go get one of the engine guys that really knows the thing that, that rebuilds these? Oh yeah, that'd be that'd awesome. Cool. Right, let me let me go get one. So this is one of the Allison's. A quick way to tell between the Allison and the Rolls Royce is the Allison's got this real funky looking intake manifold. Almost kind of looks like a modern diesel truck manifold or something up there. And this is Dan High. He is the biggest authority yeah, yeah. we have in yeah, a long time. I don't know about that. You <laughs> are. Friend. And he has been a, a crewman and a crew chief oh, on the Unlimited right. since the early 80s. So he, he knows these engines very, very well. Well, I know Merlin's better than I know Griffin's and Allison, but I'll answer what I can. So what are the technical specifications of a Merlin? Of a Merlin? Uh, yeah. 1,650 cubic inches. Um, I believe in the airplane it turns somewhere in the neighborhood of 28 100 RPM, but in a race boat we would try and turn them over 4,000 RPM. In the uh, airplane, I believe they pulled somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 inches of manifold pressure. Racing trim, we tried to pull 120 plus inches, so that's about uh, 45 pounds of boost. That's so pretty stout. Yeah, it is. And in race trim, with nitrous oxide, which all the race boats ran, um, we estimated that we made around 3,000 horsepower with them. And you, that's all happening with like the original 1940s pistons and well it is but um uh, speaking to the rolls merlin pretty much every part in a rolls merlin that was being used for racing had to be modified the case the banks the valves the valve springs the cams the blowers i mean every part the wheelhouse the blower which is a blower drive everything was modified i mean you can make plenty of horsepower just make it live so Interesting. Allison's are, are a little different. Um, there's one boat that continues to run an Allison today. I don't know exactly what they pull for manifold pressure. The Allison's just a little bit bigger engine, 1,710 cubic inches. Uh, it, uh, whereas the Merlin is uh, mag uh, aluminum, the, many of the parts on an Allison are magnesium. Um, is that the same Allison that makes transmissions today? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, it was Allison GM. Mm -hmm. Wow. The interesting part about some of these engines, at least on the Merlin, um, back during the war, uh, there were a lot of U.S. manufacturers uh, building parts for the engines. So you might see an intake manifold that had cast in it General or Maytag or stuff like that. It's pretty <laughs> interesting. So there were all kinds Maytag. of stuff going on. Yeah. How often did you have to rebuild after a race? Was it after every race or? When we were racing the Merlins, the blower drive assembly, and you probably heard, maybe heard the term quill shaft. So it was common to break a quill shaft, which was a blower drive shaft, um, was pretty common. By the time I was involved in racing, they had pretty well beefed that particular piece up but the blower drive assembly was still the weak link, especially on the earlier model engines, which down the road we were forced to use you know, as the years went by. After every time that we ran a boat, it didn't matter if it was one lap, three laps, five laps, every time we ran an engine, I should say, we took the blower off and checked the blower drives, checked the gears and whatnot to, to make sure all that stuff was good. Don't you have some parts in there? The engine shop here at the museum is, is working on uh, a, a Merlin engine right now. got some polished valve covers we're real close we're real close we got to put the harnesses on there's some plating we have left to do obviously put the valve covers and then we have to plumb it and so anyway so this is the blower this is the thing that really differentiates the horsepower output between an Allison and a Merlin so there's two stages there's one impeller here and one impeller here and so the air comes in and it blows out and comes back down the middle and blows out and then it gets thrown out. This is centrifugal. It looks like a turbocharger. Mm -hmm. uh, this tube actually replaces on the airplane was an, an after cooler to cool the intake charge or to keep it from detonating. But um, since... You spray nitrous or... Well, the, the nitrous used to go in the bottom of the blower right here with extra fuel so you can't just put nitrous in because that's just air you have to add fuel with it so we'd put uh, nitrous and then fuel in here after cooler actually intercooler was removed and replaced by this 
uh, chrome tube when they we to, they started running uh, water alcohol injection for what we call ADI or anti detonation injection. So. Yeah, race cars do that too. You can get rid of the intercooler if you have something else to. Exactly. What's the difference between the Merlin and a Griffin? Uh, the Griffin is pretty much a, a big Merlin. So whereas the Rolls Merlin is 1,650 cubic inches, the Griffin is 2,239 cubic inches, I believe. Uh, this particular model has a single stage blower on it, which means it has one impeller, whereas the Merlin uh, Rolls Merlin, and this is the thing that, that made it so much faster, has a two-stage uh, blower. So it has a 12-inch impeller, I believe it is, and then and followed by a 10-inch. So it's like having two blowers in one. The version that ran in the Budweiser during racing also had a two-stage uh, blower. So it could put out, you're looking at 4,000 horsepower, close to it. So they were taking the larger Griffin and putting the Merlin's two-stage blower no on I'm it. sorry the, 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 the model that the model of Griffin that the Budweiser guys would run when they were racing came that particular model came with a two-stage uh, blower on it this, okay this is a different version different model and it has happens to have a single stage on it okay yeah hard to come by the two stages are hard to come by I believe they're even hard to come by when Budweiser was racing well, that makes sense why the Budweiser guys had them because they were the ones with the resources and the backing to well they actually uh, Bernie acquired uh, uh, some of his at least some of his engine parts um, when he acquired another team that somebody is Bernie Little eighth grade dropout self-made millionaire a man with a very winning personality Harris Club team uh, were the first ones I know of, there may have been others, but the first ones I know of in 1968 that were running Griffins. And Bernie ended up buying that equipment, and, it, and I believe the boat ran as Michelob, Michelob Draft, or something like that. And, and, but, but, but that's, I believe that's how Bernie got at least some of his Griffin engines. They're not going to say to me, uh, well, you wouldn't buy this or you wouldn't buy that. I'll buy whatever they have to have to win. Is the Harris team the Tahoe Miss? Yes. We saw that one. That was one of the ones yesterday. On yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. That boat. That boat that you saw actually ran a Griffin in 1968 after the Allison. In its current form, is it an Allison? Current form. What they were running there yesterday was was an Allison. A stock. What would be considered a stock Allison. Um, they also are working on the boat when it raced. Um, ran what they called an ox stage Allison where there was actually an additional blower that was gear driven that sat in front of the engine so you basically ended up with a two stage uh, blower system and so they currently are working on configuring that that they wanted to run the boat first in, in a stock form with a stock Allison. Mm -hmm. So the two stage blower is kind of like a compound turbo and a, a diesel exactly. truck or something. Exactly. You know the more more wind you can make the more horsepower you can make. In, in a lot of ways, just looking at them, uh, the, the Allison and the Merlin are pretty similar. Um, 12 cylinders, uh, overhead cam, uh, shaft drive up to the cam. Oh yeah. Look at these rocker arm setups in here. That's that's really neat yeah this is actually this is not as nice a setup as an Allison because basically you have the cam rubbing on top of the fingers the fingers are the the rocker arms if you will yeah uh, the Allison actually has a roller here so they have a I'm sorry roller on the rocker arms and and a little different setup you have uh, one roller runs two valves whatever but both engines have four valves per cylinder um, the Allison has a pent roof design whereas the the um, on on the uh, Merlin it, the, the valves are vertical but but really similar in that way they're gear driven uh -huh. both is that driven off of like a it's like a planetary gear off the it's crank? driven off of the crank through a set of gears the planetaries actually drive the blower um, but but set of gears drives the mags and the cam Oh, that's really and these good. are the magnetos and, and on a Merlin the magneto and distributor are integral uh, one of these runs the exhaust plugs and one of them runs the intake plug so the intake side so there's two plugs per cylinder on both the Allison and the Merlin and the Griffin there's some thick valve stems 
Uh, the Allisons are quite a bit bigger. And, and sodium filled exhaust valves. I mean, we, when we were racing them, the guys used to say, well, why are you running this old junk? Well, back at that time, this old junk was what they were calling speed equipment. Four valves per cylinder, pent roof design, overhead cam. I mean, you know. Sodium filled valves, you know, still oh, do that. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, and so it wasn't, you know, it, and that gives you more appreciation. It's kind of hard to see here, but if you looked at the machine work for the time, the quality of the machine work, which is absolutely fantastic for the time and the machinery that was being used and the rate at which they were trying to build these things. It, it's just like, you, you just go, I mean, there's no way you could reproduce this engine today. There's just there's no way. This it, is really it, the, oh, it'd be unbelievably expensive. This stuff really is like the the pinnacle of innovation relative to resources, like the, the output time, it, versus it's what just, they had it's is. Just, it's just unbelievable. It really is. I mean, this is this looks like some really precise, yes. well made stuff. There's little clips on everything. All the casting, um, the machining, the and they go in and they deeper all the aircraft parts. Some of the stuff that there was a later version of this engine that was ended up putting in the. Uh, a bridge tank because they were looking for something with more horsepower. It didn't have a blower on it, uh, so they made a carbureted version of it. But and those they didn't have to spend the time and energy or the money, frankly, on a tank engine that they wanted for an aircraft engine. Yeah, it's like but, they, all this safety wire on here because if you know one of these bolts pops off, it gets in there, mm -hmm. it gets screwed up, pilot dies mm -hmm. or ends up in well, enemy territory. You have, you have two. Two mags, and that I believe is pretty common on aircraft. So if one mag fails, you've got the other one. You can still get to the ground, right? I mean, and um, in in the in the case, um, let's go in here. Do you have any uh, blower parts taken apart? We can see like this. I can't think of any off the top of my head. But here's what the rods in a Merlin look like. Oh wow. Well guys, Logan is out of town this week. She's visiting her family. That means I gotta make my own food. Reminds me of the olden days when I used to have to do that and I wasn't very good at it because I didn't know where to get it. I didn't know how to shop for meat before Logan. I certainly didn't know how to cook it. If you have those same two problems, I'm gonna help you solve both of them right now. The most important one is good chop. So we got our chicken breast here from the good chop package and we're gonna cook it. So put some butter and water in the pan, put some seasoning on there. This is really the only thing I know how to do. And just like that, we got good chicken. Good Chop has something for everyone, whether it's chicken, beef, ribeye, sirloin, filet, wild caught salmon. This chicken breast is free range and organic. I eat a lot of chicken, and I have for the last eight years that I've been going to the gym five days a week. This is some top shelf stuff. All products are sourced from the USA. Good Chop especially prides itself on sourcing beef that comes with no antibiotics or added hormones, ever. You know, your body's a lot like a race car. If you race car and you put regular 87 octane in it, when it needs some, you know, leaded 110, it's gonna run like crap and you're not gonna get anything out of it. And you work the same way. You eat good food, you will feel good, you will be more productive, you'll be happier. I'm the living testament to all of those things. Go to goodchop.com slash YouTube and use code Stapleton120 or click the link in the caption below to get $120 off your first four boxes today. It would help us out if you just click on it and browse around, see what's on there. Go to goodchop.com slash YouTube and use code Stapleton120 or click the link in the caption below to get your $120 off your first four boxes today. Right to your doorstep, no grocery store hassle. So you can see here that the rod that goes off to the A bank is a blade, they call it a blade rod, and it sits in between on the fork rod, and the fork rod sits actually on the crank journal. That's common to the Allison and the Merlin, that setup. Um, the, the Allison's a little different, but, but in general it's, it's similar. Is that so they don't have to have the, um, the banks offset? I, I believe that's part of it. I mean, so it they looks a little bit the, offset, but not very much. No, it's not offset. Um, um, I, I believe that part of it, they didn't have to make the engine longer. Uh, I don't know if it gained weight or saved weight so far as the whole rod assembly. I'm sure there was other advantages I don't, you know, know of. Um, but, but I mean, here again, look at look at the quality of that that crank. You know, the rods. I mean, it, it's they're just it's beautiful. This looks like a modern, high performance exactly. crankshaft, like you know, 
Yeah. Taking an old cup engine apart, this is kind of what the crank looks like. Yeah. You, you know, it's, 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 for the time. Nothing, <laughs> nothing's <laughs> new. It's like the whole hot rod industry is like born from the military. I'll show you one other thing that, that now I, I think I mentioned to you earlier that everything we pretty much did was to keep the engine together. And this is some of the stuff that you do to a Merlin when you're going to boat race. Um, this, this is a plate that's been being added to this wheelhouse because this is the planetary setup that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. There's a center gear that runs off the crank. That gear there drives the mags in, in the two shafts that go up to the uh, camshaft. Uh, and then there's three gears here. Those little gears right there sit in here and are driven by this center gear and then they in turn drive that planetary system that you're talking about which those are parts for down there. So now you've got a center gear that's pushing on these three gears. Well, they want to go out that way, right? And this is a, a dash seven uh, wheelhouse or uh, blower drive, if you will. And, and so it's lighter duty than the later series. So to beef it up for racing, we started adding these plates and these plates hold these three bearings. And, and there's also a matching plate uh, for this side and it keeps those three gears from wanting to go, go out you know, out, out, uh, radially. Is that due to the higher RPM? You would turn these things over what the higher airplane RPM was doing? RPM and it, it just, you know, more of a load on the blower drive, more of a, like I said, we were pulling 45 inches of uh, 45 pounds of boost, which that's many, a lot. Many, yeah. How many engines, you know, pull 45 pounds of boost, it, uh, you no. know, that, that's <laughs> a lot of manifold pressure. And so now you're, you're working that blower really hard. Well, it takes horsepower to do that. And all it's all going through those three little gears. And so they're wanting to go out, you know, go leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't want to stay in there. Uh -uh. So, hey, to finish so that's the kind of stuff that we did and still do to, to make things. This is this is actually the stock um, drive gear that goes into the crank. And that thing they call the quill shaft slid down in the middle. And it kind of like took some of the shock, but it would snap. This would is a... An, an aftermarket. Here's the matching plate for for uh, those three bearings. The gear sit right in here. That sits inside that, and you can see the difference between this aftermarket uh, blower drive gear. Can you change the boost level the by ratio? messing with the ratio inside okay, this so box? We 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 don't. We never changed them there. There are two different. Uh, sets of blower gears. Blower gears. These end up drive finally driving the blower, and the early ones are a lower gear ratio than the later ones. But you you also have in aircraft use, you could switch the blower from a low blower ratio to a high blower ratio based on this ratchet gear assembly. Is that easy to access, or do you have to take the whole front drive apart to do and that? The pilot had a button. He could go from high blower to low blower. So there was like a transmission inside there, um, almost. It was a, <laughs> it, it, it's hard to describe, but it was a hydraulically activated clutch assembly that would change the ratio. That's probably the easiest way to say it. Sort of like an automatic transmission? Uh, different, but similar, I guess. No clutch it, packs, it but a it's- a clutch pack, but when the clutch pack, um, I mean, I could get into it if you, if you really want to know. So you know, like, like a manual transmission in a car has got synchronizers and forks. So, so the, these three little gears are driving this blower, right? Yeah. Okay, so now uh, in low blower, the, they're, they're inside, uh, there, there's an assembly here that this sits in, there was a clutch pack, and it either grabbed onto the shaft, if you will, via clutch pack with splines on it, or it didn't grab onto the shaft. If it doesn't grab onto the shaft, now this blower gear is driving at the same rate that this gear is driving, right? Mm -hmm. When you would activate uh, the button, there open a valve, the oil pressure would close the clutch pack and now it would grab this shaft. And now you can see that that gear is turning at a faster ratio than this drive gear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's high blower. That's freaking cool. Mm -hmm. Pretty smart guys, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, historically, at least in my experience, most everybody would run in racing would run a higher blower ratio gear, but in low blower. Hmm. In the blo low blower that, set. So it would be like direct drive? Because uh, it, it, the, the higher blower 
drive system was uh, it could be not necessarily robust. Kind of like uh, you know, when you're racing a car, your strongest gear is your one to one, so you don't have the the multiplication. You're, you're over, so in this case, when you go into high blower, you're overdriving all this stuff. Yeah. 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 You don't race a drag so, car so, in overdrive. Yeah. So uh, I have learned that. Anyway, so that's just a little tidbit. Most, that's the way most everybody that I knew. Now I guarantee you, there were guys, including us, a few times would try different setups, including high blower and whatnot. I mean, it, but it, we were just trying stuff, you know. Anyway, well, that's fascinating. So would you like mess with stuff like? like changing the boost level like you're going out of the turn you turn it up but then you pull it back or something like that we would did we did different things <laughs> there's other guys that did more than we did i mean we guys played with blower ratio if they could change the you know if you had the the money and whatnot you might even speed that blower up even further and huh. there were guys that tried that um yeah there were there was some pretty interesting stuff when guys tried different cam grinds just like any other race, and you're just trying to do something different, make more horsepower, That's make the thing fascinating. faster. Fascinating. Yeah. Were yeah. there any other things like, like that plate that you would have to go in and do to beef these up for yeah, racing use? You know, because of the RPM you were running and the boost levels, you increase the valve spring pressures, and uh, uh, then you played with the cams to try and keep those to live at the higher RPM. Um, the the uh, case and the crankshaft you modified for the higher RPM. Of course, you take the nose case off that drives the propeller in the airplane, and you put a, a gearbox on, and that's that's the is that gearbox this right here. Or that's a uh, one version of the gearbox. It's not complete, but, but so if this wasn't from an airplane. What did no, it this come is, from? No, this was custom built for so this was hydroplane made. racing. Mm -hmm. Who used to make them back then? Um, there, uh, the company that's now called the Gearworks started out as as uh, um, Mantel Gearworks and and they started building and Western Gear they started building the Western Gearbox. This is a Western Gearbox and then um, there was a company back east uh, in the Detroit area called Fairlane Tool and and the guys that ran Fairlane Tool also raced a boat whatever and they developed a heavier duty version that was based on the Western Gearbox but but they made what they felt were improvements to it made it a little bit beefier and whatnot and then so that was those. The Western and Fairlanes were pretty common to the Merlins. For the Allisons, Western also made a gear gearbox. Uh, there was a gearbox called a Volker, Volker, an arena box. The first guy to put one of these plane engines in a boat, did they make something like this or did they just hook the propeller right to the crankshaft? I, I believe they would have had to have a gearbox, but I, I don't know who is the very first person to put this. Yeah, that's that's something you don't just you like know, build uh, in your garage. Back, that's... back in the back in the day that you know they did the the class is called unlimited and it, I believe that it that was really coined from post World War Two when there was a number of engines floating around and and you you were allowed to run anything in an unlimited it, it it didn't mean that that you know anything goes on anything but it but it, i believe it was like unlimited cubic inches you could you could put whatever you wanted into a boat huh. what teams were you doing this for back then um i started working on allison's for oberto i worked on allison's for one year um wasn't really an engine guy but i was exposed to it and then I worked on Merlins with the Circus Circus and the Executone and the first Pringles up until uh, 80 through 86. And then we moved to turbines in 87 and I ran, I ran a team until 95 and, and worked on teams. I think the last year we raced was 2017 with the Elstrom Racing. Huh. Yeah, this stuff is this is cool i would i think this is probably cooler than turbines because there's just it's different something uh, about it uh, i don't know turbines, if it's the... turbines the, the nice thing about turbines i mean we used to probably spend 90 to 95 percent of our time doing engine work hmm. when we were racing merlins you didn't have to do that with turbines even even when we ran the hardest that we ran turbines you didn't spend that kind of time and what that allowed it allowed us to do and and in some ways forced us to learn more about the race boat and so um, especially um, when fuel restrictions came on and everybody was 
on more of a level playing field, um, then you know you have to find speed somewhere, and so you start to learn and play with your race boat more than hmm. you did with the engine stuff. When did these hydroplanes go from the World War II V12s to the turbine engines? Okay, well, it's a story that kind of was matter of necessity, and this is the Lycoming T51 gas turbine that is utilized in the boats today. Now, in the early 80s, it was apparent that we were going to start to run out of old World War II fighter plane engines. They just weren't going to last forever. So there was an, an effort to try to find a replacement engine. And the turbine engine seemed the most likely next step because of the way that it performs. Um, most of the engines that are in unlimited racing are repurposed. Of course, the, the World War II fighter plane engines were the first big motors in these unlimiteds. And then this is out of the Huey helicopters of the Vietnam era. So it's about repurposing and utilizing equipment that maybe wasn't necessarily designed for that purpose. And these engines, where the big engines, the big block engines, we ran through a three to one step up gearbox. So if the engine was turning 4,000 RPMs, the propeller would be turning 12,000. These are actually ran through a gear down gearbox. Interesting. The, the one problem that these have is these engines were in helicopters, so they were designed to be at full power 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. So in racing world, being at full power 100% of the times is not necessarily what you want. <laughs> so, so what the guys are doing now is they have an adjustable canard wings in the front of the boat and they fly the boat with the canard wings and then they try to their best ability not to move their left foot because turbine engines need to spool up mm -hmm. and they spool down. So in that if you list if you go to a race today and you hear a boat going into the turn and you hear this popping sound that means the driver got out of the gas too fast and is going into compressor stall hmm. so you don't want that and coming out of the turn as well if they get on it too fast the engine hasn't had a time to whirl back up so there's this lag time and you lose your momentum so now the driver is charged with going into a turn at 200 miles an hour turning left and not moving his foot off the gas pedal. So are they trying to slow the boat down with aero drag? Yes. Interesting. So it's all it's all about powering through the turn without losing your your power to your motor. And if if you do that well and it's if it's all you can do not to get your foot off the gas because that's just instinct. Yeah. But, but if you have what it takes to go into a turn at 200 miles an hour and not take your foot off the gas, you can go really, really fast. Huh. So is this the back? This is the back end. So this would be the exhaust end. Where the, the big chrome pipe would stick yeah. out of yeah. the boat. Yeah. Okay, so if you look in here, you see these blades that turn. Yeah. There's two sets of those blades here. This is actually the power absorbing portion of the engine. All right. And it turns a shaft that actually goes back through the, the shaft and back yeah, out the front end. So if I turn back here, you'll see that shaft turning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's the output shaft. So what happens here is there's two sets of fans here, but up here, there's also a fan and that fan drives this whole compressor. So there's seven sets of what they call axial blades or regular fan blades that lead up to a centrifugal impeller which looks like a turbocharger impeller so this gradually steps up the air pressure and then this really ramps up the air pressure at the last stage okay so now you're basically taking and you got basically a supercharger here compressing the air hmm. now the air comes flowing out of here in, in inside this housing and comes back to here and makes a 180 degree turn towards the inside. It's all veined. And these these uh, manifolds back here have fuel nozzles in them. 
and that's where the fuel is injected. All right, and 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 lighting a turbine engine is like a blowtorch. You, you, once you get it lit, as long as you keep running fuel to it, it'll run. So, so the only way to shut it off is to shut off the fuel. So now you've got the fuel spraying in here and it's burning. That hot air now goes forward and takes another 180 degree turn and hits that first turbine wheel that drives this compressor. So is there a gearbox here? That well, hang on, we're getting, <laughs> we're getting I'm, out of I'm the trying game. to figure out where, okay. the, where so air goes in and out in the same... Air comes in here. I'm sorry. Air okay, that's what I'm... I'm sorry. Yeah, and you see those are set of guide vanes, and then there's... there's so the fresh rotating. air comes in here, and it's incrementally compressed mm -hmm. until, until it, it gets, gets up here, and then it turns and turns up and comes just on the inside of this sheet metal, turns 180 towards, towards the center, and fuel is added, and it's now burning right here on that inside channel, comes forward and turns again, and hits the first fan that runs this whole section. Interesting. Okay, but these are not con connected to that first fan. These are separate from all of this stuff. That's what, why they call it a free turbine, as opposed to, I believe the term is fixed turbine, where the power producing portion of the engine is connected to the compressor section. Interesting. So there's, the fuel isn't added until almost the end of the air path. Because you gotta get, you have to get enough pressure built up so that it won't quote unquote backfire. You have to, there has to be enough pressure built up to get to, to it's going to go the, the way you want it to so so if you you watch your race and you hear it spooling up when they're starting whoop, you know that what they're doing is you're rolling the engine over on the starter to get the air moving enough that then you can start the engine and you actually have to stay on the starter long enough to get the engine up to idle otherwise the fuel control says i'm not up to, to idle speed yet I'm going to give you more fuel. Well, you don't have enough air going through the engine. You'll burn it. You'll burn it down right off the bat. If you have weak batteries or you don't stay on the starter long enough, you'll burn the engine down. Huh. You'll never get to idle. So you have to use this big starter to help the engine get up to idle. And idle is actually 50% of full speed, which is interesting. Huh. Mm -hmm. So that's. Just in case anybody's not getting it, so the air is coming in here, getting incrementally impressed till it goes through here, mm -hmm. and then after it's lit and burning and then flying out through the exit path, mm -hmm. it has to go through blades that are connected to that output shaft. Well, it goes through first blades that are connected to the compressor. That's what drives the compressor fan. That's what drives the compressor. Okay. In other words, you have to have something has to drive this thing to make make it compress the air. So it has to complete the cycle. Mm -hmm. So first, first set of blades that it hits turns the compressor section, the power producer, the compressor section. And then after it goes and turns that, then it comes back and hits the next two set of blades that turn the output shaft. The output shaft goes down right down the middle of the compressor and comes out the front. And all those things are spinning around it. Yep. And then yep. The these are spinning at 18,000 RPM and these are spinning about 16,000 RPM at 100%. So the last thing it touches before it's way out is the, the drive fins and then and it so then, comes out. Then now you take this output and you run a shaft up to a gearbox and then, and then the gearbox is is a, a a V drive, and then the shaft goes out the bottom of the boat and down the propeller. You have to be propeller driven. That's pretty wild. See, whenever I, you know, not knowing anything about these, I figured it was just like a jet engine that was thrusting jet. out the back of the. Nope, I had no jet. idea. So, so the jet, if you will, or the thrust, and not really thrust, but is more the heat. But the thrust needs to be absorbed by these two sets of fans to drive the propeller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I could sit here and say there's probably not some thrust from the exhaust, but but the idea is to absorb all that energy and put it out to, through the propeller. That and now sense. you ask about propellers. This is a two blade. Uh, this one happens to be a forged Italian wheel, but it wouldn't be uncommon to run a cast steel wheel back in the 70s, 80s, 50s, 60s. Okay, um, th this one do the job today. You, you can go anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so. Once a turbine came along and started making more horsepower and they started putting more horsepower to the propeller, pretty soon we started breaking propellers. So then rather than run cast wheels, uh, guys started building wheels out of 
steel forgings um, and started to add three blades uh, or went to three blades and a higher pitch and, and whatnot. So that propeller there is probably 19, 20 inches of pitch. This would be a more modern propeller here. This would be on the order of 25 inches of pitch. That would be made out of a forging. And this this propeller happens to be made out of three sections of a forging welded together. How much would one of these cost back then? Uh, I don't know about back then, but if you were to buy a propeller now, it'd probably be fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. Just for this. That's crazy. Yeah. If you want to go fast, you go. <laughs> that's, Speed. that's how you go one hundred and sixty miles an hour average. <laughs> yeah. Speed costs money. Yep. Yeah. What is the design of this little ridge here? Everybody has their, every prop builder has their own little idea how they should build a propeller. And, and then most boats tend to like one type of propeller or another. And, and then after a while, if you run a propeller too long, that's what happens. That's also a Ford fuel. So there's only a certain amount of life because you're, you're really stressing that propeller. I think I watch something on YouTube where they were talking about if, if this blows up sometimes the broken piece can fly up through the wing and screw the whole well worse than that um, a lot of times if you break that propeller you'll tear up the drive shaft you might break the gearbox and when you do that then the engine goes into overspeed mode and you lose the engine at the same time so that that's not uncommon. You hope that doesn't happen, and you try and set up your engine so that won't happen, but you could lose the whole shooting match because of, of a propeller. So that's why they're so expensive. It's kind of the the keystone. You can't go fast without a good propeller. You can't. And if you got one that's not reliable, you could cost yourself a lot more money. Yeah, yeah. and it, it's, it's you know, the, the guys are out there running. They, you know, they're, they're, they're changing their setups based on what they, you know, what propellers they have in the truck. Huh. And how many of them? And how much time's on them? Calculated risk. Huh. Yeah, see, I come from car world, so it's it's neat to... It's like different forms of motorsports are so different on the surface, but the more you dig into them, the kind of the formulas and the variables are the same. They're just filled in with different types of pieces. If you've never watched our channel before and you thought this video was interesting, maybe you're a boat person. I have no prior experience with boats, before going into this museum, didn't know anything about it. And it's probably pretty evident relative to the questions I ask. We are like stock car, drag car people. That's my frame of reference. But if you're into history of racing, whether it's boats or cars, you should check out our other videos because we have all kinds of stuff that's very similar on different topics. And if you'd like to support what we do, it costs you absolutely nothing to hit the thumbs up on this video. It helps other people find it. And if you're concerned about the preservation and growth of hydroplane racing sharing this video with your friend would help us a lot if you're wondering why there's plastic on the hood it's because the roof was leaking on it and yes that that is rolls royce phantom it's a flood car and i have daydreamed many times about putting a uh merlin in there if it would even fit which doesn't really matter because i couldn't afford one of those anyway that car doesn't have any interior that's the only reason i was able to buy it is it's uh totaled <laughs> but you know you get the gears going in your head we got all kinds of goofy projects going on maybe someday and that ad for good chop that you probably skipped through earlier in the video i swear that meat is really freaking good everything in that box that we have cooked so far has been phenomenal and we will definitely buy it ourselves logan's dad ordered a box like it's it's legit if nothing else it helps us if you just click on the link and see what they have. Just, even if you got no intention of buying anything, just click on it because that helps our chances of renewal and that keeps the channel going. So thank you.